Hey everyone, it's John Lorden. And it's Danielle Hallen back with another episode of Crime After Crime, and it should be a good one. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> this one being recorded for release on November 1st, 2018. Thank you so much for joining both of us here today. Uh, and if you're joining us here on YouTube, hello. <laughs> and you can see us. <laughs> you, you can actually see me waving. And if, if you're on audio only, uh, just know that I was waving. I'm a friendly guy. That's how it goes. <laughs> Um, before we get started with our crime stories today, we have a few things to announce. First of all, there is finally an official Twitter account for Crime After Crime. Insert applause here. Uh, it is at Crime After Pod. And you can thank some infant one month old baby for getting the Crime After Crime podcast, or not podcast, but the Twitter account shut down. <laughs> John, <laughs> I'm looking at you. <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe we should just tell that story real quick. So I was setting up the Twitter account. I was all excited about it. Danielle saw that it was happening. We started kind of retweeting about it, and I was still making changes to the profile. And I saw that it had an option for putting your birth date in there. And I figured, well, you know, this isn't a personal Twitter account. This is for the show. So I want to put the birth date of the show in there. So I put September 1st, 2018, and all of a sudden the whole screen goes white and there's just this little note in the middle of it that says, you've been locked out of your Twitter account. I'm like, what the heck is going on? So Underaged. Yeah, apparently you, have to, you have to be at least 13 to have a Twitter account, uh, which I think is hilarious because first of all, any 13 year old that knows about that or under 13 year old, it's just going to lie about their birthday to, to open up a Twitter account. That's that's really not a great mechanism they have there. But what I love about it is they assumed that a one-month-old <laughs> tried to sign up for Twitter. <laughs> Keeping up with their baby friends. I don't know. I yeah. think it's strange, too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hey, I got to follow Gerbers. I got to get on there. <laughs> um, so, yeah, oh, it was man. shut down. And uh, honestly, it was not easy to unlock. I had to literally send in a photocopy of my driver's license, uh, which once again was weird because this is an account for a brand. It's not an account for me personally. So what if I grabbed someone else's ID? How would they even know? I have no idea. But it's, it was all strange and unfortunate. And then we had to take back on Twitter that it had started yet and made everyone wait a little bit longer. But it was... It was eventually figured out, and it actually also ties in on how to vote, which I'm going to remind you guys about again, because as always, you guys vote at the end of our podcast for who you thought brought the best story, and it really worked well last time. I put a little timestamp in the comments and in the description, and you guys were able to go there, go directly to the poll, um, so there will be a little I that pops up on the YouTube version at the top of your screen when we're talking about voting at the end of the video. You click that put your vote in, and if you somehow lose track of it, you'll always have the timestamp there. But we also do a poll on Twitter, and originally either I or John had put out the poll, but now that we have an account, I think we're going to put it out on the Crime After Crime account. So you can just go to Twitter and do at Crime After Pod. I mean, I'm sure John and I will still retweet it, yeah. but it kind of brings things to one place that you know you can look forward to instead of John and I just sneak attack surprising you with a poll <laughs> the day of, so. Yeah, and that's the weird thing because the Twitter poll can only be open for seven days. Uh, and yeah. the YouTube poll is open the whole time. So if you do miss the first week, uh, you can still go to the YouTube version, look in the description box below. Danielle will leave the, t the time tag in there. You can just click on that. It'll jump you right to the spot where the card pops up and you can go ahead and vote. So um, let's talk so about, now. yeah, what happened last episode? <laughs> well, John, <laughs> last episode, it, oh man, I already knew it. I called it. I knew it was coming. I threw my towel in already in the last episode and it was right. You guys voted for John. I mean, by a landslide. Twitter was a little bit closer. I think he had 60% and I had 40% of the votes. Mm -hmm. And on YouTube though, whew, 92% of the votes went to John. So Woo! here I am. So I'm uh, handing over the crime after crime mug because I no longer deserve it. But I'll, <laughs> I'm coming back this month. I am. So okay. John. All right. Oh, thank you. Oh, there we go. 
And what did you uh, what did you put in it for me? Mm. There is there's no telling. <laughs> I might have poisoned it. Yeah, <laughs> I know. It kind of tastes like misinformation. It kind of tastes like alcohol. Are you trying to get me drunk there? Um, <laughs> I've got to right. take my title back. Yeah, and I have to thank everyone that voted for me. Thank you so so much. I really appreciate it. We're now one for one in terms I of. Know. You really, you really brought it last month. You did. Yeah. Well, I think we're both going to bring it this month because I, I feel the the game kind of uh, anteing up here. So today's topic is craziest getaway. We've got a whole lot to go into there, um, including the history of getaways. Let's just go ahead and start with some of that. This is information from Wikipedia under crime scene getaway. A crime scene getaway is the act of fleeing the location where one has broken the law. It is an act that the offender or offenders may or may not have planned in detail, resulting in a variety of outcomes, Uh, which is also part of the reason why I thought this would make a great episode, because you can look at ones that were planned or ones that were spontaneous. Mm -hmm. But uh, a perpetrator can escape a crime scene by running, riding a horse, driving a getaway car, or riding with a getaway driver. If motor vehicles are used for the getaway, then each vehicle is a new crime scene. That was a really interesting aspect that I didn't necessarily consider before. Yeah, I don't think I've ever considered the fact that it brings on different crime scenes. Even That's wild, because usually we think about that and immediately assume that when it comes to like a murder or, you know, missing persons, but I never would have been like, oh, the vehicle for the getaway is also a crime scene. That's yeah, interesting. Absolutely. There could be evidence found in there. That might be a little foreshadowing for the story that I'm going to talk about. And there's also the possibility that you have multiple vehicles. More foreshadowing, mm-hmm. more foreshadowing. <laughs> <laughs> Once humans domesticated horses, that animal became a favorite way to escape a crime scene. Jesse James and many old Wild West bank robbers and train robbers of the 19th century used horses to get away from the scene of their larceny. Uh, Of course, then we get to cars. Getaway cars are prevalent in major crimes such as bank robberies, foreshadowing, (laughs) and homicides. Very frequently, but not always, a getaway car is stolen and is abandoned soon after the crime in the hope that the vehicle cannot be traced to the offender. The earliest robbers known to have made such use of an automobile were the anarchist-inspired Bonneau gang in Paris, December 21st, 1911. Wow. Yeah. They're taking it back. They're the OG runners. 107 <laughs> years ago was the first car getaway. Wow. Uh, later, the method was used by John Dellinger and Bonnie and Clyde, whose exploits got wide media attention and inspired many less known robbers. So... That's our little history on getaways. Danielle? All right. Are you ready for my story, John? Because I I really did. I really did bring one this time. I've got my (laughs) crime after crime mug filled with I don't know what. And yes, (laughs) I'm absolutely ready. Okay. So this was actually a robbery that occurred in Monroe, Washington. And just like my story about wasabi pants, I had to triple check to make sure all of the sources were correct. And this wasn't something that was made up. So prepare yourself. This is probably one of the most unusual and bizarre robberies slash getaways that I've ever heard of. And that says a lot because I'm obsessed with the story of D.B. Cooper. It was almost what I brought to the table today until I found this. So in September of 2008, an unknown man set out to plan the perfect robbery and perfect getaway. It was a scheme that a lot of people would probably call crazy and most wouldn't dare to do, but somehow it worked out exactly as planned. And that is going to have your jaw on the floor when I tell you what the method of getaway was. So this unknown man spent a lot of time before the crime planning everything, and he actually put up a Craigslist ad asking that 15 to 20 men show up to the Bank of America on Old Owen Road on September 30th, 2008 at 1115 a.m. And the ad, he told these people it was actually for a maintenance project, something called Restore Monroe, and it seemed very, very legit. And they were told to wear dark blue shirts, surgical masks covering their nose. I think he also asked that they wear safety goggles and yellow vests if they had them. And he even offered to pay them $28 an hour for their assistance. So on the morning of this 
maintenance project, <laughs> <laughs> a councilman just so happened to be working across the street, taking phone calls at one of his family businesses and was just gazing out of his window at the beautiful October day. And he was staring at the bank and he noticed that a Brinks armored truck had parked right in front of the Bank of America. And he noticed a seemingly harmless man started walking across the street and a blue long sleeve shirt sunglasses and a baseball cap. And this man had kind of long tousled grungy hair that he had tied up into a ponytail. And he was kind of struck off by this at first because this man was also carrying a large spray tank, but he chalked it up to basically just being one of the landscapers. So he wasn't too concerned, but this was not the case. So the driver of the Brinks armored truck got out of the vehicle with this canvas bag of money and the unknown man suddenly took off running straight for the truck. He ended up throwing his large can over to the side and took out what appeared to be pepper spray and started spraying it relentlessly at the Brinks driver and ended up bringing him down in just seconds. So this unknown man took the bag, the canvas bag from the driver while he was down in agony, screaming of being pepper sprayed, and he pulled out the money. So the councilman was watching this whole entire event. And at this point, he had already called 911 and was relaying all of the information to the operator moment by moment. But he finally decided to throw the phone down and chase after the robber himself. Because at this point, the robber is running away from the scene as fast as he possibly can. Well, first of all, I just want to stop you for a second because attacking a Brinks guy with pepper spray, I believe oh, yeah. the Brinks guys are armed, aren't they? Yeah, and I actually go deeper into this further in the story, but they are. They're trained specifically how to handle certain situations. But when I was looking into this case, they normally are prepared for someone to approach with a gun. Oh. So this guy was really taken off by the fact that it was pepper spray, like yeah. something very not nearly as threatening as approaching with a gun. So Well, and if he can't see, even if he did have a gun, what's he going to be exactly. able to do? Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Exactly. So as I said, this councilman's now running after this man and the robber ended up throwing his hat off and revealed he didn't have long hair. It was all part of a disguise. He had really dark short hair, but the councilman unfortunately was never able to see his face and he ended up losing him at the edge of some woods that led straight to a creek. So authorities quickly arrived on the scene. And no, this isn't the end of his getaway. <laughs> and they were dumbfounded when they went to look for a man in blue and ended up finding a few of them all dressed the same, standing out front of the bank after the whole ordeal. Uh. And actually only two of the men remained at the bank to be questioned by police out of the dozen that actually did end up showing up. So dozens of these people replied to this Craigslist ad. Right. Um, but they actually believed that they had just been stood up. And then when they found out there was a bank robbery, <laughs> they ran, essentially, because they realized they had been suckered into playing a part of a robbery. So this is when authorities realized they had kind of been set up and, you know, that the man had told these people they were being promised money and it was a community project. But thanks to the councilmen, they were led straight to the bank of the creek. And when they ended up there, once they were there finding up the robber shirt and pants, it easily explained his next action, which is the second part of his getaway. Okay. So witnesses started to come forward saying that after the councilman chased him into the woods, this man ran through the woods. And when he reached the river, he jumped into a perfectly placed yellow inner tube. Okay. For his next stretch of escape. So he floated, money in hand, 200 yards down the creek and a yellow inner tube. Wow. wow. Exactly. <laughs> Wouldn't you at least get a camouflage inner tube? Yeah, I know. <laughs> and I was wondering the same thing. I'm like, you can get black ones, you know, that might yeah. match more similarly to the color of the water. But why on earth, if you are trying to escape from a crime, would you use a yellow, a all bright this, yellow inner tube? Yeah, all this planning. And I, I mean, at least get a can of spray paint, even if you've only got a yellow inner tube. <laughs> Exactly. And I'll go into other things he actually attempted later on, which will make you shake your head even more. Wow. But he ended up actually abandoning the tube and was running off again. So he successfully robbed an armored vehicle with only pepper spray and an inner tube. 
And a bad so, Craigslist ad. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> that these poor people showed up for. So within 30 minutes of the incident, a helicopter was combing the area searching for this man in the woods, and there was absolutely no sign on him. So they assumed there had to have been someone else involved. So a witness also ended up coming forward saying they saw a second man with binoculars staring at the entire scene from a nearby parking lot by the bank before the robbery. And he was no longer there, and he seemed to disappear around the same time that the man started running. Running. So they assumed that he had probably been picked up by the second person somewhere close by to where he ditched the raft, mm -hmm. but they also weren't sure this was a legitimate sighting. So they even considered that he was picked up by someone in a boat. And that just sounds like something out of a movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they continued to search the area for clues, hired professionals to analyze footprints. The FBI came in to assist because a bank was involved and they started to assume that it was likely a copycat going off of a movie, The Thomas Crown Affair. Mm. Now, I'm not familiar with this movie, but apparently this almost fits directly into it. And people even are comparing it to Pineapple Express. Yeah. I don't think I even remember what happened in that. But they believed he was- I think was a, a lot of people that watch Pineapple Express don't remember it. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Might have like to do it. with the state of mind that you watch Pineapple <laughs> Express in. <laughs> But I mean, it was just insane. And they're really surprised because while it did seem like a copycat sort of robbery, he brought his own little quirks into it. And again, like we were speaking about before, the pepper spray on an armored Brinks vehicle, like people usually plan a very long time to attack these Brinks vehicles. And yeah. it usually involves a lot of violence. Yeah. But he somehow managed to pull it off in a much less threatening manner. But then... While he thought his escape was successful, he actually ended up being caught. So a homeless man came forward saying that he had been hanging out around the bank. Uh, I think it was like a month before this all happened. And he spotted a man named Anthony Curcio or Curcio. Okay. I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce it. We know how I am with pronouncing things. But he was actually doing a test run of the heist before the event. That's not also a very common thing. That's kind of a dumb thing to do. Or am I the only one who thinks that? I mean, I get wanting to try it out, but... Yeah, and you when, have to at least case this, the place. I mean, you have to yeah. take a look at the logistics and figure all that out. Um, it's interesting because in my story as well, there is some aspect of like a, of a dry run or possibly uh, another time that they were going to do the robbery and then didn't at that point. Um, but are you talking about like, was he testing... He the was inner tube ride? Like, did he have the yellow <laughs> inner tube out there again? Actually, I guess this is a good time to insert it. He was originally going to do this with a jet ski. <laughs> <laughs> so he actually was hand dredging the lake for a while, trying to get everything like deep enough to where he can use a jet ski. And on, he actually tried these different trial runs multiple times. Wow. And one of the times the jet ski didn't work. So that's when he started thinking of a different plan. But he was, he was full on acting out the entire thing, like running and all. Yeah, like he wanted to be in Miami Vice or something, oh, jump yeah. on a jet ski. Exactly. <laughs> and you would think if you're at least going to try that out, you would probably not leave a trail behind. But he actually, I think, either stored stuff behind one of the dumpsters there to have mm. to use, like some of his um, items that he was using, like his uh, disguise. Yeah. And he left stuff behind, so the homeless man took it. <laughs> and then the homeless man also got his license plate. So after the whole thing went down, he went to police and he was like, look, I saw this man do an exact replica of this robbery and I actually have some of his items and I have his license plate. So wow. they just, exactly. I know. So this homeless man, man, he was on top of things. Yeah. Good Samaritan. So, exactly. And so they took his license plate, found out it was Anthony Curcio, and they actually followed him for a while and he threw out a bottle in a trash at a gas station. And they took the bottle out and they DNA matched it with the wig he had also thrown behind at the crime scene. And it was a match. So wow. they were able to arrest him. And so it's interesting what happened with his story afterwards because he had attended high school in Monroe. So he was very familiar with the area, but then he ended up leaving to play football for Idaho. And he had this huge dream of making a name for himself. That was his big thing is he wanted to be known. Yeah. But he ended up basically, you know, succumbing to a partying life and he hurt himself um, and ended up having to stop playing football, ended his career. And it really upset him. And he did eventually marry. He had two children, but he 
began becoming addicted to the painkillers because of his injury. So most of the money he made flipping houses, he lost due to his addiction. And that's when he started thinking of this ingenious bank heist. Wow. He do, had, yeah. Do you know how, how much money he was getting away with? Um, they refused to release it for a while. I have seen one number floating around that it was around 400,000. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So he had actually observed the Brinks vehicle for three months at that specific bank of America. He took notes on the schedule. He diagrammed the location of the bank cameras. He noted the blind spots of the Brinks vehicle. He even went as far as estimating the weight and like how much money was being transferred at a time. So he would know what it would take to successfully move it afterwards. And as I said, he had originally tried to move the jet ski or use the jet ski and it hadn't worked. So he put a lot of thought into this and he was asked why an inner tube and he was like well you know a lot of people make fun of me for it he's like but it worked <laughs> yeah and you have to give him that yeah you do absolutely um, absolutely and then, and then thinking of the craigslist ad you know immediately confusing authorities yeah yeah because that could really slow them down uh, especially exactly. uh especially it might have actually helped him that there was only a few guys dressed up that way because if they got there and there was 15 of them and yeah, they might, asked they might think yeah yeah well and if they asked one of them why why are you here you know we were hired for this craigslist thing the guy didn't show up um they could have discounted them really quickly but if you only have two guys and one of them's like i don't know i was hired for this craigslist thing you might not be sure is he really your guy or not are you going to start yeah. processing him at that point or are you going to continue trying to chase this guy when you probably didn't even know you know, where he was at that point anyway. Um, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And interestingly enough, they only considered it circumstantial evidence at first. They didn't consider the DNA match enough. Really? Uh, exactly. Which I thought was very interesting. So he ended up being released after a month, but then eventually $220,000 was recovered after one of his associates made a plea deal with the FBI. And that landed him in prison for five out of the six years he was, you know, sentenced and yeah. he spent that time in Texas and Florida. Um, and when they released him, he actually repaired his marriage with his wife, totally rebuilt his life. He went on to publish a few children's books about, uh, I think Inner it was tubes. different types of sports actually. <laughs> <laughs> He's even been on a Ted talk since then. And he, he actually speaks regularly to encourage youth, particularly athletes to not fall down on the hole of drugs and overwhelming expectations wow. and to find healthier ways to cope and learn from his mistakes because he's tried desperately to really come back from this, you know, but most of the world still refers to him. And this, I, I, th I found interesting as DB tuber. <laughs> Someone coined him that on a radio talk show, and he's not been able to live it down since then. Oh, yeah, it is kind of terrible, <laughs> especially especially for someone that obviously he seems like he's strongly motivated by public perception and and you know trying to be famous in some way. So, um, I, I believe he actually, if he did take four hundred thousand dollars, he doubled what DB took. I think uh, DB only made off with a couple hundred thousand dollars before he jumped out yeah. the back of the plane. So, oh my goodness, that story uh, is so wild. But yeah, he he did good. I mean, they the only money they weren't able to recover was whatever he gave to his getaway driver. And I'm not sure if his associate was the getaway driver that maybe eventually came forward. They never specified it. I'm assuming not because they were never able to find the driver's money. Hmm. I'm not sure. I was never able to really figure out 100% what was happening with that, but. This whole thing is just interesting to me because, I mean, this man just out of nowhere was like, hey, I'm going to rob a bank. And I mean, he went he went deep in it. No yeah. experience whatsoever. Formulated this brilliant plan despite how odd it was. It was very odd. Yeah. And I mean, he would have gotten away if that man hadn't witnessed some of it. Absolutely. Um, and it's interesting to me about the DNA aspect. And I do think I understand why they could have said that was circumstantial. If it was, because uh, you don't know the history of the wig, you know, I mean, it could be exactly. that he wore it at one point. And then you also have it compounded with the fact that you have a witness that says, well, I saw him in this area previously. So it, it could be that he left his DNA, you know, from a previous visit to that area that might have not been related to the crime as well. Um, it's pretty interesting, though, that they would... That, that, that it would fall apart like that. 
I definitely think it could have had a lot to do with the wig because I've actually personally covered a case on my YouTube channel where a wig was involved and it was, I mean, everyone knew it belonged to the person that had been missing. Yeah. They knew for a fact they had pictures of this woman in it. Um, and when they tested it, you know, they couldn't say for sure that she was the last one to wear it because it's a wig, you know what I mean? And it, it, other people could use it. Right. You never know if it had been tried on in a store. So there's no way to say for sure. Yeah, I think I ran into a case that was kind of similar where it was, uh, I believe it was a, a clown costume and they were testing the wig. Actually, it might be, it might have been the fibers. I think the fibers from the clown yeah. wig were found in someone's car. So a little, a little bit different. Um, you know, I worked as a store manager for Blockbuster Video and of course they're famously out of business at this point. So I don't mind sharing this information. But one of the things that uh, always concerned me was how they had us move money because they didn't have Brinks trucks uh, come around to the stores for us. Oh, man. So, so yeah, literally, you know, the store would open at like nine in the morning. We the opening crew would be there between seven and seven thirty. And at some point, whoever the manager is, is walking out that front door with literally a bag that has thousands of dollars in it, uh, going to their car, putting it in their car, driving to a local bank and putting it into a, you know, a special slot at the bank basically for, um, for businesses. But yeah, and after a, a weekend at some of the stores I was working at, it was a serious amount of money. I mean, definitely something that I'm sure some people would have considered uh, for a robbery like that. And we even heard stories about uh, stores that were robbed. We did have a safe and yeah. the, the safe had a time delay on it. So even if we wanted to open the safe, like to get change, just to get quarters or singles or something, we'd have to go to the back room, punch in the combination, wait 20 minutes, and then oh, man. go back to open it up. Um, but we even heard about robberies that happened, even with that mechanic, where basically the robbers would come in like after closing, uh, get everyone in the back room, make them wait for the safe to open take it and then leave. And uh, if I recall correctly, I actually even heard of a couple murders that happened around some of those robberies. So pretty crazy. Yeah. I know. And like with the Brinks trucks, like I even get nervous around them because I'm scared I'm going to make them nervous if I look at them for too long. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know. Oh, and man. there's also instances of Brinks robberies where um, it seems like employees are involved as well. Another oh yeah, thing I could up. easily see that exactly. But everyone was just so shocked because he managed to pull it off so perfectly. But again, it all comes back to, you know, they're usually expecting guns and a lot of people and they're not expecting one-on-one -on -one combat with pepper spray. So yeah. I think it really took the guy back and he did not know what was happening and it all happened so fast. Yeah. And I kind oh, of, man. um, it's, it's gutsy. I mean, just knowing that they're armed and how they're supposed to handle those situations. I mean, if, if you pepper, pepper sprayed him and you didn't get both of his eyes, you know, his life could have been over right there. Oh, yeah. Um, it well, was a real gutsy play. Yeah. And it was saying, though, that he used so much pepper spray. It was like for feet behind this guy. Like it was just everywhere. So maybe yeah. he was scared of that. And so yeah. he just really went crazy with it. Yeah, that's probably that was probably the most risky part of, of the whole story was that initial rush to run up there and grab that bag. But uh, then he just leisurely went down the river <laughs> in an inner tube. Oh my goodness. That's so crazy. Yeah. Because, I just, I have a, a bizarre picture in my head of him just like, you know, chilling, oh yeah. holding a little drink with a little <laughs> umbrella in it, cruising down just the river. Just a sack of money. Uh, yeah. <laughs> wow. But he was, he was saying when he was thinking about his escape plan, the most typical routes people take are usually by foot and it's usually on the roads or in the areas directly surrounding it. They're not going to think to check the river. Yeah. And which I mean, I mean, maybe in some circumstances, but I think that's brilliant. I never would have thought of that. Yeah, no, he's, um, he's, he's, he's got a good mindset going on there for logistics. And, um, also it's kind of nice that there's an upturn in your story where he's improved his life and he's trying to help others and stuff like that. Um, it just, it shows that, you know, when people are in a bad spot, they still have the same tools sometimes and they can use exactly. them in a bad way, but uh, exactly. I'm, I'm glad that he got clear of all that and has finally put his life on track. Good one, Absolutely. Danielle. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I'm excited to hear I'm excited to hear yours. <laughs> yeah. That was that was a really, really good one. Um honestly, I'm not sure how it's gonna go this month. We'll see. You you might you might have pulled it out. And that was a really interesting story. And uh the the inner tube thing, I just 
I can't get it out of my mind. I've now have an image burned in my brain. I know. But, me too. That's what I've been going through <laughs> for the past like week. Yeah. All right. Well, get comfortable because uh, here comes mine. One thing that impresses me about a solid getaway is the amount of planning that goes into it, just like you were talking about. I mean, this guy was just a great planner. He had thought things through really well and then executed on that plan. Uh, my story for today sounds like something right out of a Hollywood film, but it's real and it resulted in the biggest gem heist in Britain plus one amazing getaway. It occurred in 2009 and is known as the Graf Jewelry Heist. Now, Graf Diamonds was founded in 1960 by Lawrence Graf in London. They are now a multinational jeweler with over 500 employees and 50 stores worldwide. And by the way, Danielle, uh, if you want to see some amazing jewelry, you should just go to their website and check it out. But know that everything is ridiculously expensive. <laughs> Powell is uh, going to have a lot of pressure on him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, seriously. <laughs> um, yeah, time to time to take up another job or five <laughs> to try to get some of this jewelry. Um, Thursday, August 6th, 2009, two well-dressed gentlemen show up to Graf Diamonds via taxi. They're processed at a security checkpoint and led into the store. One of the men was wearing gloves. However, it's not uncommon for some of the eccentric personalities that go to the store to wear gloves. So, you know, just a, a pair of like nice leather gloves. Okay. What was uncommon is they somehow made it through security with two handguns. They pulled them out and started the robbery. They selected 43 items and placed them in a bag. Then a woman working there as a shop assistant, Petra Enar, was taken hostage and they headed outside. They were inside the building less than two minutes. Wow, that's yeah, impressive. Absolutely. Um, and a blue BMW is outside waiting. Uh, a security guard saw Petra and started heading over in a rescue attempt. The crook saw him and fired a single gunshot into the air, starting a public panic. And they took off in the car and they thankfully left Petra behind. Uh, she describes it as one of the most terrifying experiences that a person can be put through. As the car oh, raced, man. yeah, it just, I, I'm really happy that um, I think in both of our stories, there's not a lot of at least senseless violence. Exactly. Um, yeah. yeah. Even the way they use this gun, you know, you have a security guard that's running towards you. It, it's weird because in some versions of the story, I heard that they fired it kind of in his direction. Other ones are saying, no, they just shot it straight up in the air. But it, it seems mm -hmm. like they weren't intending to hurt people. And they were really using Petra um, to try to just make sure that they got to the car. Exactly. Um, and she's also the shop assistant. So I'm sure she was helping them in terms of, you know, clearing mm -hmm. out, clearing out the cases and, and bagging up the stuff that they were going to take. So as the blue BMW races through the streets of London, it crashes into a black cab. Uh, the car continued driving away with the driver from the cab and some locals from a nearby pub starting to chase the crooks. Oh on, my goodness. On foot. They basically thought that it was a hit and run. So they're they're trying to chase oh. down this blue BMW. So they have no idea what actually happened and yeah. what they're really chasing after. Wow. Yeah. They don't know that it's related to this robbery at all. Three more shots were fired, scaring off the pursuing citizens. And I've heard different accounts there. Some of them say that they shot into the ground. Other ones said say that they shot into the air. Sometimes they say that they only shot once. Sometimes they say three times. So just all kinds of inconsistencies. Uh, the crooks made it to their next car, a silver Mercedes. The bag of jewels was handed off to a man on a motorcycle who took off. The other, the crooks uh, got into the Mercedes and continued their escape. Eventually that car was also ditched and they transferred again into a third vehicle thought to be a black Ford Galaxy or a Volkswagen Sharon. But where were the police cars during all this? These guys are, you know, they're hopping from car to car. They handed off the jewels to a motorcycle. The motorcycle no takes off. No police to be seen. Yeah. <laughs> where, where's, there's, who's chasing them exactly? Well, someone had hired trucks and had them blocking traffic at strategic points on the escape route. They effectively cut off the police's access to the fleeing criminals. Wow, that is brilliant. This reminds me of that movie. What do you know the movie I'm talking about? Is it called? It's with all those people. I think it was somewhere overseas and they had all the different cars that they used and they even drove through this guy's house. 
Oh my god! Is gosh. it the one where they were using the Mini Coopers? Was Mark Wahlberg so. in it? Like a, the Italian the, job, yeah. the bank job, the what Italian was that? job. Yeah, this is literally. Str- <laughs> this sounds so much like it. Definitely, man. Definitely. They went all out. Yeah, and you're talking like uh, they said at one point they talk about a seven and a half ton truck. So I would imagine that's something almost like a trash truck or some kind of very large shipping truck. Oh, also, yeah. big transit vans. And they basically had these, hired these guys, had them park at specific streets that were blocking those streets off. And that was keeping this getaway path just completely clear for them. Uh, police believe that there, there were at least two getaway drivers for the cars. CCTV was able to track the man on the motorcycle until he ditched it and walked into Green Park just a short distance from Buckingham Palace. They lost track of him once he went into the park. Uh, And that's an interesting aspect that I really didn't find any information about is we're talking a BMW, a Mercedes, a third car, which they can't identify. And I didn't, even despite the fact there's been a trial, I didn't get any clarification on that. A motorcycle. um, I don't know if these vehicles, I would assume that they were all stolen. Oh, absolutely. I would assume the same. Yeah, because they're not going to have these registered to people that they can trace back on all this. So, But these guys are ditching vehicles all over the place, renting trucks to block the route. Nice vehicles at that. Yeah. (laughs) Very nice vehicles, pricey ones. (laughs) Absolutely. Sounds like it might be a bit of a well-funded operation. But um, So Detective Chief Inspector Pam Mace from Scotland Yard's Flying Squad said, this was a well-planned robbery with a number of vehicles used to help the robbers escape. These men are extremely dangerous and fired at least two shots on busy London streets as they made their getaway. And despite the fact that they made off with only 43 items, uh, they were primarily rings, bracelets, necklaces, and watches. However, between all those items, they had more than 1,500 diamonds and amounted to 40 million pounds or about 65 million US dollars. One of the more expensive pieces, a diamond necklace, single piece, was worth three and a half million pounds alone. That's insane, John. <laughs> yeah, this is That's like insane. This is the type of jewelry shop for like celebrities and royalty, and so yeah, this is like a very very high end. I mean, just ridiculous uh, types types of jewelry that that we're talking about here. Uh, one officer said. They knew exactly what they were looking for, and we suspect they already have a market for the jewels. That's what I was kind of about to say. I was assuming, I was like, they had to know exactly what to pick out for them to get as much money as they possibly could out of it. Yeah, and I mean, just to have the channels to offload that type of stuff. um, Yeah, this isn't something where, uh, you know, Joe Schmo and his buddy get together and figure out, hey, we can rob this place and, you know, put together all these resources. It really seems like there was quite a bit of money in planning, but we're not even through it all yet. There's even more planning. Uh, Despite all the resources and planning, it would take only a few mistakes to bring this ring of thieves down. When police were processing the BMW, which like we were talking about earlier, every car now becomes a crime scene. Mm -hmm. They they found a sawed off shotgun in the trunk with four cartridges and more importantly, a burner cell phone was found wedged between the driver's seat and the handbrake. The phone included a call history that gave investigators crucial pieces of the puzzle. Though the numbers were anonymous, investigators were able to track the movements and retrace the steps of the phones that were involved, which led them to their suspects. There was also CCTV images of the two men during the robbery. A makeup artist would come forward with a very interesting story only a few days after the heist. She recognized the two men in the CCTV footage. They hired her to apply aging makeup to them for what police think was a failed attempt or dry run two days before. They told the artist it was for a music video and they wanted to look 30 years older. It took four hours to apply the latex prosthetics, hair coloring, and complexion changing effects. It appears they did not do this again on the day they actually pulled the heist, but the security man at the door did comment that he believed they may have had some light makeup on. So I'm not sure if, um, and I've heard different things about this. In one instance, I heard that they didn't like the aging effects after they got them put on. They thought that they looked too fake. So they, oh, they wound okay, up yeah. not using them. Um, when it comes to the security guy, I'm wondering if, uh, you know, I've 
had to wear makeup because of doing shoots and stuff like that before. Mm -hmm. And sometimes like your eyeliner will stick for a couple days. I don't know if he was noticing remnants of the makeup that had been on them previously. More uh, than likely. Yeah. And especially with hair coloring things uh, and seeing the pictures, there's actually photos of these guys when they're walking oh, in. Oh, wow. And, oh, okay. And, and there's photos of them since they've been caught. Minor spoiler alert. Uh, spy, spoiler alert. Um, but his hair color is significantly different. It's much darker in the photos of him actually doing the robbery. So I think that some of that stuff might be left over from this makeup run that they did uh, two days before. Outside of all that, the taxi driver also specifically remembered them because their fare was only nine twenty, and they handed him a twenty dollar uh, or twenty pound note and told him to keep the change, and it's the largest tip that he's ever received. Making See, I feel like I feel like among all these greatly planned things, they made some really rookie mistakes along the way, like really random small things. Yeah, I mean, to think of all the resources, multiple cars, you know, rentals of these trucks, and we're going to take a taxi to go there. I, exactly, I just... and then and then on top of that, make yourself memorable by leaving an insane tip, and then on top of that, to leave a burner cell phone behind, or at least use the burner cell phone for longer than just the heist itself. Yeah, and I'm not sure if they left it behind intentionally. I don't know if it could have fallen out of their pocket while they were, because remember that car hit the cab. So there oh, might've been yeah. some jostling that happened. Uh, might've thought it was there exactly and it wasn't, yeah. okay. Yeah. Uh, investigators would eventually locate nine people that they believed were involved and charge them. Of the nine, five were convicted. Aman Kesai was thought to be the ringleader and one of the two men in the store, though he denies that he's the man in the CCTV footage. He's described as a drug dealing media studies student who dropped out of St. Mary's University. Uh, he had used several of the burner phones leading up to the robbery. He was eventually convicted of conspiracy to rob, kidnapping, and possessing a gun. He's serving a 23 year sentence. Another man named Craig Calderwood admitted he was the second man on the CCTV footage, but said he was forced to do so by two underworld figures who threatened to kill him and his mother. The jury was unable to reach a verdict. However, he was retried and later found guilty. He's serving 21 years. A man named Thomas Thomas, who hired a seven and a half ton truck to block the route, was convicted of conspiracy to rob. He's serving 16 years. Solomon Bain was released from prison just one month before the robbery. He bought the phones used in the raid and hired a Ford Transit van to block part of the escape route. He's now back in jail for another 16 years. A man named Clinton Mogg provided the flat used by Cassay and Calderwood to have the makeup applied. He's now serving 16 years for conspiracy to rob. And while the crew that pulled the job might have been caught, many think that the true mastermind or Mr. Big behind this has gotten away scot-free and with the jewelry. Uh, if that's true, he employed more than a few cars to make his getaway. His plan likely involved several fall guys as well. Uh, Graf Diamonds laser engraves their diamonds with a GIA or Gemological Institute of America tracking number that is invisible to the naked eye. None of those tracking numbers has shown up in the nine years since the heist. It is assumed that whoever stole the gems has cut them down into smaller pieces to resell anonymously, possibly disposing of the pieces with the GIA information. A one million pound reward is available for information leading to the recovery of the stolen items. Oh, there's absolutely a big man involved that's not been found. Mm -hmm. That's my personal belief. Because that man, he walked in to the woods, like the park with the diamonds. And I was expecting when you said they got caught that you, they would have found the diamonds. Yeah, no mention of the motorcycle driver uh, in, in any of the information I bumped into of him being I charged would, or, yeah. I would love to see the area. I'm about to be on Google Maps for a while after this, looking at this area to see how he could have gotten out of the woods or if there's any way for a vehicle to get in and out. But I assume they would have looked into that already. Yeah. That's yeah. bizarre to me. Well, and even to have that information, it almost it almost sounds like they talked to an expert on CCTV at some point and said, you know, because London is extremely well covered in their public oh, yeah. areas with CCTV. Oh, yeah. And they, they literally have 
uh, I, th I think they're called watchmen, but they're people that are officers that are manning those and watching them and actively communicating back with officers on the ground. So for them to have hit this spot of a park where someone's able to walk into this park and disappear. And just, yeah. Really, really, it just sounds really, really weird to me. Oh, he's off somewhere rich as can be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and it sounds like he was already probably doing pretty well for himself before this heist, but maybe doing better for himself now. And if you consider it from his perspective, um, he's really the one that that made the, the biggest getaway here because he didn't have to do the robbery. The, oh, guy, yeah. the guys that did are sitting in prison. Um, well, I feel like it's possible the motorcycle guy was was the big man in charge. He would want to be the last one to have control of the diamonds. And he knew worse comes to worse, you know, he can go away while the others are back behind. They're getting caught. Right, right. Or I think that's a huge possibility. Or maybe it's your right hand man. But yeah, it would certainly be someone that's very close to the, the, the true ringleader here. And uh, yeah, the guys that got caught, I don't know if they're really... Even to consider them the ringleader, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that they're the ones that really formulated this plan. It, it kind of feels like they were cogs in the wheel on this. Yes, but. especially based on the stories that they were giving. I don't I don't think they were behind it at all yeah. personally, but wow. Yeah. Well, outside of that, the biggest gem heist that occurred before this one was also at Graf Diamonds in 2003. And they've had five other robberies of their stores or facilities since 1980. And literally, if you look into these individual cases, all of them are millions and millions of dollars in each instance. And uh, in, it seems like in about half of them, uh, the, the diamonds are never recovered. Um, I think at this point, it might be time for them to consider figuring out their security <laughs> yeah. and maybe a plan if someone comes in because that's a lot of robberies and a lot of money that's walked in easily and walked out easily no questions asked yeah and it's i, I was trying to get a better sense of that i i saw just a little bit of footage of the man actually entering and the security checkpoint literally just looked like it was just a security guard it was a really narrow hall i mean you can't really yeah. enter without him encountering you but i don't know Obviously, he didn't have a metal detector, um, and it's just it's one of those things because the security guard has even talked about it, and he's like, "I knew something was off." You know, as soon as they walked in, I thought that they were wearing makeup, and I even told someone else, "I think something's weird about this." Wow, and, really? Yeah, and that's the same security guard that made the run after them when they left with the hostage. Um, but yeah, to your point. Get a couple of locking doors so that, you know, they, they can't even go in until they've been truly vetted by security and at least run a metal detecting wand over them or make them walk through the metal detecting archways. Just something. Absolutely. Because I've been, yeah, I've been in clothing stores, like just clothing <laughs> stores in New York City that have checked me out so much more than that. I'm talking walk through a metal detector, pat down. Right. Like you don't get to go through the door to get upstairs to the clothes until you've been searched. So yeah. the fact that this diamond store <laughs> with that much money in it yeah. doesn't have more than that's very surprising to me, especially after all of the different incidents. Yeah, they've got a history of this dating all the way back to the 1980s. And uh, it's just amazing. It's I, I can't believe it. But someone Someone definitely got away. Also want to give a quick thank you to my sources for this story. BBC, The Guardian, Telegraph, and of course, our good old friend, Wikipedia, who I also donated some money to recently because they were looking to raise funds again. And I use them so often on the channel. I just wanted to help with that. So, yeah. Wow. Crazy, wow. huh? Those are two very, very good, interesting stories. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, it's going to be a tight one this month. Yeah, because, I mean, both of them, it's like complete masterminds behind it, but on two like very, very different extreme levels. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, it and was, they both got caught. Yeah, well, I don't know. I'm telling you, I think my well, guy got somewhat. away. Yeah, yeah. A someone in yours definitely got away. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on top of this, I ran into so many good stories. I know Danielle did too, and we want to share a couple of those with you. Just really brief instances of these kind of crazy, I call them just straight out bad <laughs> getaways. Oh, absolutely. Like absolutely horrible getaways that 
oh, man, I don't know if I feel bad for these people. <laughs> I can't figure it out yet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just some of the more interesting stuff we bumped into that wasn't quite enough to do for the whole crime after crime story. But uh, the first example I want to talk about is in Essex, London, 2009. Uh, 18-year-old John Smith was part of a team of four that were robbing a jewelry store. He was the getaway driver for a smash and grab job. I think they made him the getaway driver because he wouldn't be great at smashing and grabbing. He had no arms. I saw this one. I saw this one. And I don't understand why they would F. Why would they? Oh, yeah, man. <laughs> yeah. So he's waiting in the car with no arms. Uh, they jump into it. It's a Ford Focus. And he floors it. Uh, apparently, he needs help from one of the passengers for changing gears while they're driving away. He drives as fast as 160 kilometers an hour or nearly 100 miles per hour and made it about 50 kilometers or 30 miles before crashing. Why is it always the guy's name, John Danielle? That's, that's John. What I'm <laughs> it's always... I have no idea, but it really is. All of the all the strange ones are named John, and that's not me saying anything about you. I think you're great. Well, let me just but say, there's a lot of Johns. Name. There's a lot of Johns out there, so of course you're going to have a, a, a percentage of them. But uh, yeah, he did have prosthetic arms, but he literally was not wearing them. And uh, yeah, it's. Uh, oh man, it's yeah. A weird one. See, I found a very, very strange one as well. And I don't even know if you would consider this a getaway. <laughs> but a couple in Alberta, Canada actually tried to go into just a convenience store, like an average gas station. And they weren't trying to rob it. They were actually just trying to buy everyday things, but they were using a stolen credit card. And the clerk at this convenience store started questioning them and was really concerned about the fact that, you know, this person believed it was stolen. So they called authorities before the couple even realized. And when authorities got there, I guess they never really planned a way out if they were to get caught using the stolen credit card. So the man actually tried to first totally leave the female behind, <laughs> just left her in the dust. What's his name, Ran John? <laughs> no, they didn't release names, so it could be, but I'm going to pretend that it's not because okay. you don't deserve that. <laughs> oh, thank you. But he ran to the back of the store and the back door was locked. So he ran back up to the front and proceeded to try to fight the police officer. And the female was just left there talking to someone else, probably saying, oh, I'm so sorry for him. Like, we didn't mean this. I don't know what's happening. But then she was obviously mad. He left her in the dust. So she then tries to run to the back of the store and escape everything while the officer and this man are literally wrestling on the ground and she can't get out of the back door. So she actually just started climbing up some of the items in the back room of this convenience store. And there's a video and I could not figure out what her plan was to escape from here. And I still can't figure it out. She's just climbing she's, up in a corner. She's some, well, that's what I thought. I assumed she was hiding, which is still a horrible getaway Yeah, because they're going to search for you. But she actually <laughs> climbed up into the roof, like into the ceiling but it was those really cheap, like particle board, cardboard type of, you know, squares. Yeah. Yeah. I know what you're talking she about. She made it halfway through the store. Again, I don't know where exactly she was going. And she just completely fell through the ceiling. Yeah. I was, I was going to say, fell through the ceiling. <laughs> those acoustic tiles don't hold so much weight. <laughs> no, and I'm sure you could have heard her climbing around up there, but she just fell right through the ceiling on top of everything and then got up like nothing happened and tried to run away again. But they both ended up being caught. Well, thankfully, it didn't sound like they were going to get very far anyway. <laughs> no. Okay. Where I just still am trying to figure out where she thought she was going to go when she got into the ceiling. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Where do you think you're going to get out of that situation? Oh, man. Just try to get as close to the front door as possible and then break through the tile, make a Which run for it. Which even then doesn't make sense because the owner of the store was guarding the front door and that's originally where she had been standing. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't I don't know what was going through either of their minds, but clearly they had not planned an escape and then their last minute escape was not very great. <laughs> well, like I mentioned at the start of my story, it's all about the planning, right? So here exactly. here's a story about some not so good planning, I don't think. Two thousand eleven South Wales in the United Kingdom. This is about the worst Facebook first date. She drives to his home. He asked her to give him a quick ride to briefly visit a friend. She took him to a shopping mall, waited five minutes. He comes out of the mall running towards the car, screaming, go, go, go. He had threatened a cashier with a kitchen knife and stole 250 pounds. 
She took him home, was trying to end the date when police rolled up and arrested them both. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Now, thankfully, I, police did believe her. So they did they did let her go. But she did originally get arrested with him. I was going to ask about that. I would be so upset. I would yeah. be so upset. First of all, if someone went into a store for a couple of minutes and then ran out screaming, go, 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 it might just be my crazy mindset. But I probably would have gone without them getting in the car first. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Maybe that's horrible. But that just screams something's not right here. Yeah, especially first time oh, that man. you've met this person. You know, you only know them from online and you're getting together with them for the first time. And yeah, take me to the store. <laughs> <laughs> so I can oh rob it. And then imagine being asked after that. So how'd your date go? Right. And, well, I got arrested. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Having to tell it's your crazy. friends. That might be the worst part. <laughs> hey, how was that first date? Oh, that's so horrible. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> See, I, there were a lot of very interesting ones out there. There was one that I looked into where this man, I don't know. I can't remember exactly if he was trying to rob a bank or... I don't think he was robbing a bank. I'm pretty sure it was just a convenience store, but he actually just escaped out of it afterwards. And I think he thought it would be great to get away on his wheelchair, like in his wheelchair. Like no one knows for sure if he was actually handicapped or anything, but he just left the crime scene and slowly rolled himself away. And honestly, I think that's a pretty good getaway <laughs> because they're not, they're going to expect the person responsible to be booking it and running, but he was oh. just casual going down the road like nothing had happened that's i wouldn't think twice about him that's interesting well it depends did he show up in the wheelchair is he like heading to the robbery See, in his wheelchair i'm telling you i tried to find more information on it but it seemed people were just so fascinated with the fact that he just escaped in a wheelchair slowly yeah and was it do you know if it was an electric or if it was a manual Again, I, I couldn't figure it out i'm yeah. pretty sure it was a manual one i did find another instance though where it was an electric one but this person was booking it and the electric one and that to me is a dead giveaway <laughs> so <laughs> well i got one more interesting one to share with you arkansas 2013 an intoxicated woman crashed her vehicle and tried to flee the scene in a battery operated power wheels truck like the ones for kids yeah yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> she crashes her car drunk, gets out, runs into someone's front yard and grabs a Power Wheels truck that was sitting there. Oh. Uh, she also had no pants on. So just, wow. just to paint the picture clearly. <laughs> um, the father of the little boy that owned the toy getaway vehicle saw what was happening and got her out of the truck. She then walked to her mother's house where she was arrested she blew a 0. 0.217 into the breathalyzer. Oh, man. Isn't that ridiculous? That is, that's wow. one of the highest amounts that I've ever seen. Yeah, she was I really think that's the up. highest amount that I've seen. But, I mean, you can run faster than one of those cars, okay? I've yeah. been in one, like, at my age, okay? Because I have lots of nieces and nephews and I have kids. They're fast, but they're not... They're not that fast, so I don't no. know what she thought she was doing in that. Yeah, I, th I think that the Power Wheels company is smart enough to make them slow enough so that parents can at least run them down and make sure that they're... Exactly. Yeah, in case the, your child's trying to run people over. Yeah. Relatable. Yes. Yeah. Or that your kid's going to get hurt themselves. I, exactly. When I was a little tot myself, I had a big wheel that I drove across the street right in front of my house. I got hit by a truck. Oh, wow. Yeah. <gasps> yeah. I've been hit by a car too, but not that way. So we're we're just some wow. odd people, John. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> oh my goodness. So yeah, so many stories. I literally had more stories, but we're we're running out of time to to get to them all. Uh, and of course, we want to talk to you guys about um, what do you guys think? Who's yeah? Who's, who pulled it off this month? Last week it was. The, f the first episode, I feel like it was it was pretty tied. It was pretty even. Last week, I knew it from the moment you opened your mouth. I was going down. But uh. this week, I don't know. I still, I don't know because I really enjoyed your story for the different elements that they put into it. But yeah. I also think an inner tube is bizarre. <laughs> it, it's <laughs> weird because dad. I think that's what's similar about our stories is there's good planning that's going on with them. But in one instance, you have a, an individual that did some good planning. Sure, he hired some guys to help him with it. But, you know, he's clearly the yeah. ringleader. He's clearly the, the smart guy. Uh, in my story, it's more about organized crime, it seems like. I mean, some type of syndicate of criminals that were working together to pull it off. So yeah, I'm going to be really interested to see 
where the audience is going to go with this. It's up to you guys. So Yep. You guys, don't forget to vote. Now is your time. I have the eye up in the corner of the screen. You guys click it. Go ahead and vote. At this point, I'm sure as well, we will go ahead and put something up on Twitter. And in case you miss this, which... It will happen. It happens to me all the time. Don't worry about it. But I will also have the timestamp down below for you guys. Absolutely. Uh, and coming up next month, we've already picked our topic. We've got another good one for you guys. This one is worst motive to murder. That could get interesting. Yeah. Uh, I know that, you know, Danielle and I have looked into enough cases in what we do. Uh, I've already got a few that are popping into mind, but I'm really curious to look specifically for that contingency, what is the worst motive to murder someone? People uh, snap over some interesting things. I've already mentioned one to you, John, when it came to the most bizarre weapon, most bizarre weapon and this worst motive to murder, man, they kind of yeah. go hand in hand. You never know. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's also an interesting peek into the mindset of, of someone just to see what, what would trigger them in such a way. Uh, just yep. to set some ground rules on it, I think we should at least make it, it has to be a murder that was actually attempted. Yes, I'll agree with you. Okay. Maybe not executed, but at least they were going to kill someone there. You know, they admitted it or there's enough information to prove that they were actually going to kill someone based on X, whatever the X exactly. is. Exactly. Okay. I agree with you. But we really quickly wanted to take a moment to tell you guys about another podcast that we both really enjoy. And if you know me, I haven't stopped talking about it, so this will not come as much of a surprise to you. And it is the Without Warning podcast by Sheila Wysocki on Lauren A.G. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Isn't she doing amazing work with that? She has done absolutely amazing work. And there's been a few changes happening in the case lately. I know her most recent podcast um, that I've listened to. So you'll be a few podcasts behind at that point. But there was a big shift in the case and some legal things changed. And that brought down a lot of walls for her. So she's been covering a lot more different things. And Oh, man, she's really on to something with this case. And I cannot stop listening to her podcast on it at all. Yeah, there's it's it's really interesting because you're getting such a unique perspective from a private investigator. And, you know, it's one thing I consider myself a media reviewer in terms of how I do my coverage on Lord and Arts and stuff like that. I'm not a private investigator. And quite honestly, there's not a whole lot of podcasts that I listen to that are private investigators. So her perspective is very unique. She really lets you into her thought process. And that's a good thing because she's also brave enough to do that. And if you don't agree with her, you can tell her exactly why. And exactly. she'll actually hear you. And um, I, I've got a pretty good relationship with Sheila. She actually called me. It sounds like you've, you've heard a bit of what happened, but... Just a little bit. Yeah. Essentially, there was a wrongful death suit that was going on. Uh, with this case. And the judge became, uh, I guess you would say, a bit controlling about the media that was going out around this and effectively was telling them to stop the podcast. And um, because Sheila uh, was doing such good work with the podcast, because they were finally getting leads and tips and following up on that stuff, uh, the family decided to pull out of the lawsuit altogether and the podcast is rolling on and there's no gag order to be affecting it. And it's going to continue, I think, until there's an answer uncovered. I just, I don't see Sheila stopping. She is so motivated by this. Oh, yeah. She's, I don't, I don't see her stopping anytime soon. And I mean, I don't know how many exactly episodes there have been already. Um, I might've been listened to them in like one day, <laughs> but I mean, I feel like with most podcasts like that around one particular person, usually there's just not enough to keep going, but she somehow is digging up so much information. And I think it's because this case, in my opinion, and I feel like hers as well, was mistreated so badly. Um, yeah. You know, it's really mishandled by authorities. So a lot of information that should be out there just isn't. And she's the one digging down to the bottom of it. And it's been so impressive to see what she's found out. And every episode has me on the edge of my seat. And I do not see her stopping until she gets someone to crack. And I think, honestly, she will. Yeah, she scares me sometimes. Not in a bad way, but I, she is just, she is a boss. I was, I was literally just going to say, she's a pit bull. Yeah, she's, she's, she she's not going to let go of it. And I know that uh, what motivates her um, 
is just coming from a different place. I mean, she is really looking for justice. She understands oh, yeah. how this family feels. She's dealt with other families in similar situations. So uh, I really recommend if you guys are looking for another podcast to pick up while you're waiting for the next episode of Crime After Crime, jump in, start at the beginning, get into Without Warning. Uh, I've also covered Lauren Agee's case on my channel. Yep. If you want a little bit of a primer before you start the podcast, head over to Which, Lord and Arts, check that yeah. out. I honestly would suggest that because it, it's kind of confusing in her podcast at first without a gist of it. So if you really are someone who needs something to grab onto first, definitely check out John's video first. Yeah. And of course, I've got visuals there. We, we look at some maps and some photos and stuff like that as well, which can help you kind of gel it all together uh, while you're taking it on. And uh, grab your notebook and ride along with that podcast. It is just mm -hmm. it's, it's your chance to be a private investigator in, in a certain way. It's, it's amazing. The, the level of access, the interviews that she's doing, it's just, it's its really, really good. Probably some of the yeah. best work that I've seen out there right now. Oh, absolutely. And then she has even more on her Patreon, so I can only imagine. Yeah. But um, I want to remind you guys, if you are listening to the audio version of this, we also have a YouTube version. You can look us up at Crime After Crime on YouTube and find us. And don't forget to subscribe while you're there. And John and I also have separate channels. Mine is just Danielle Hallen. If you look me up on YouTube and you can find me on Twitter at Danielle Hallen. And I am Lord and Arts on YouTube, or you can look up Brain Scratch. That is my most popular show. At Twitter, you can find me at Lord and Arts. And we are also still always looking for ideas for crime after crime. If you would like to submit ideas, suggestions, comments, you can email crimeaftercrime at lordandarts.com. Crime After Crime is produced and hosted by Danielle Hallen and John Lorden. And we want to give our patrons a massive thank you. They're the ones who allow the audio version to have absolutely no ads on them and very limited ads on YouTube. And we also give patrons a bonus Patreon special every single month. And we've been doing some very interesting ones that I think you guys will really enjoy. We dig a lot deeper into just kind of more personal aspects about ourselves and behind the scenes of, you know, filming or creating a podcast and filming on YouTube. And also patrons get a special personal shout out every time we do a Patreon special. So it's really awesome place for you guys to go and they keep us going with these limited ads. Massive yeah. thank you to you guys. Yeah, and if you guys want to hang out with us more than once a month, that's your best way to do it. For as little as $1, you can join the Patreon squad and get that special bonus segment also. If you enjoyed this episode of Crime After Crime, please rate or review us on whichever platform you found us on. We need all the help we can get. We're still young and growing, and <laughs> you guys are a major, major part of that. But until next time, we will see you on Crime After Crime.